Hi, and welcome back to another video. Um, this is obviously on demand, which should be watched after you see the one on supply. So, here's a little cartoon to kind of get you going. Calvin Hobbes, probably one of the best written cartoons ever. Fortunately, he doesn't write anymore, but as you can see, like Calvin argues, there are lots of demands. So, we're going to talk about demand today. And the good news is it's pretty straightforward, especially after having gone through supply. So let's start with the basic definition of demand. Um, it's very similar to supply because demand and supply are obviously related. There's again, there's a willingness and an ability to buy goods and services. And just to clarify, when we talk about willingness, we obviously assume that people have a certain want for the good or service. That's just implied. I mean, it kind of makes sense that why well, even talk about certain things people want if they don't really want them. So that's kind of just really kind of common sense. And then also we assume that you have the money to buy the product or service. So for example, do you have a demand for you know, lunch at Cordova? Uh, for most of you probably the answer is sure. You have at some point a, a desire or a willingness I should say to, be, to eat and you have the ability. You probably have enough money in your pocket to get something. Now if we're talking about a new Lamborghini or my favorite car Tesla, an $80,000 plus dollar car, I'm going to go on a limb and say that most of you do not have the true demand for that product, including myself. You may have a willingness, as you all know about me, but definitely don't have the ability. We're not able to buy the product because we just don't have enough cash. So the good thing when it comes to demand is that you and I think like consumers all the time. So this is really much second nature. And these pictures obviously just highlight us going out and buying. Um, and that's really what demand is, is trying to, uh, you know, obviously satisfy that unlimited want of, of, of goods and services um, with the money that we do have. And so we do that all the time, and so demand will be really common sense for most of you. Okay, so there's a law of demand, just like there's a law of supply, and they're very similar yet different. So here is the definition, and if you notice, obviously, the word in the red is key. Um, there is an inverse or an indirect relationship between the price and the coin being demanded. And that is the exact opposite of supply. So what that means is that if there's a higher selling price, and remember when we talk about price, it's always selling price. So basically if the price goes up, then there'll be a lower demand. So price goes up for something, the amount that you want of it for the most part goes down. And I know some of you are thinking, well, there's always exceptions to that rule, sure but we're just talking in general terms. And so the reverse is true as well, that if the price would go down for something, our de quantity demanded would go up. Um, so, and again, just think about it. When you go to the store and you're expecting to pay a certain amount and you see that they've doubled the price, and you're really bummed and you probably won't buy as much. Um, but then of course, if you go to get a t-shirt and they're having a sale, meaning the price has gone down, you're willing maybe to buy a few more. And so we do this all the time, uh, we, depending on the product, but we always react to this in, in the general sense of if price goes up, we buy less. If price goes down, we buy more. Okay. So then there's a demand schedule, which is just like in supply, is based on what we just talked about with the law of demand. And as you notice, of course, is here is soda, and as the price was going up, the quantity is going down. So at 25 cents, we demand 890 units a day. It's a lot of soda. Versus when it's $2.75, we only demand 100. And of course, these deals, some of these deals look okay. Some of these deals look pretty not so good. But again, the idea is that we, you know, demand schedule is just a reflection of the law of demand. All right, the graph, of course, is what you'd expect. It is a representation of the schedule we just looked at. Um, what you want to take note of is obviously, yes, as it says, you start in the upper left and you go down to the bottom right. But again, at P1, the price is, say, 100. You're going to consume, say, 50 units. But as the price goes down, right, if this is going lower, the price has to be smaller. So the price goes from 100 down to, say, 25. Look at how much we want. We want a whole lot more. We wanted 50 when, it was, when the price was up here. But now the price has dropped to say 25, we want over 100. So again, there's that relationship. High price, low quantity, low price, high quantity, inverse relationship. So that's what we always want. Okay, moving on. Again, like I just said, consumers demand greater quantities at lower prices. All right, moving along the curve. This is exactly like supply. So basically means that if there's a change in the price, it will just change how much we want of that product or the coin demanded. 
Um, as always, we stay on the demand curve. So in this example here, going from price one to price four causes us to move down along the curve and can increase our coin being demanded. Um, of course, it could be reversed that if we were down here somewhere at price five and also the price went up, we would move up along the curve and buy less as the price rose. Um, so again, this graph is just a representation of that law of demand, saying that there's an inverse relationship between the price and the quantity being demanded. And again, just think of your experiences going to the store and buying things. Prices are higher, you buy less. When prices are lower, you buy more. This graph reinforces that. And of course, as always note, the labeling, again, price on the vertical, quantity on horizontal. The demand line should be labeled just D, okay? And that's basic labeling on all graphs you do for demand, just like you did in supply, okay? Oops, all right. Um, obviously, when there's a shift um, in demand, just like in supply, what causes a shift? Uh-oh, I think I messed up, hang on. Hi, and I'm back. Uh, I don't know what I was thinking, just had a brain freeze. So here we are talking about demand shifts. So obviously a demand shift means that there's this triangle just means a change in demand. So basically something causes demand for us to change that has nothing to do with price. So the graph looks like you'd expect. You have one graph here where for this can of soda, let's say at $60, we bought 500. And something's caused us to shift to the right. That's why it's labeled D1. That's our new line. So make sure you label that as well. But something has caused us to consume more, um, to go from A to B. Now, these numbers down here are wrong, so ignore those. It should be higher. Um, the idea is if you shift to the right, you're consuming more, because obviously zero is here. And, and so A you're, you would actually be like 300 here, and then you shift to the right, and that would be 500. The reverse is like this, and this is correct, thank goodness, where you are starting here at A, um, and something's caused demand to shift in or to the left. You were consuming 500 units at $60, and now it shifted in, and now you're only consuming 400. Again, the price on both of these has not changed, so it must be something other than price. Just like we talked about shifts in supply, it was something other than price. Um, and so what are those things? Um, there are several, and we're gonna go over them here in detail. Here's a list of them right now. Um, you can look through them. Um, you don't have to write these down right now because we'll be coming, we'll go over each of them. Um, I would say the first two are pretty simple, including the last one, expectations. The one that gives most people a hard time is this one, substitutes and complementary goods. And we'll talk about that um, in a couple of slides and that should make clear up. It just takes a little time, but I think after you watch it and look at it, it should make sense to you. So let's go ahead and get started. So taste and preferences. And this is real simple. Think about what's popular and what's not. If you go way back in your history and your life and you think back to eighth grade and what was popular, you remember these. You remember pillow pets. You remember how much you wanted one. You, you desired one. You pleaded with your parents for one. Your parents may have fought for one during the holidays. It was a huge demand, okay? For most of you, not so much anymore. Um, your tastes have changed, um, for most of you, I assume. Um, and as they change, demand changes. Something maybe a little more recently that's been popular in the last year or so are these energy drinks. Okay, people really want them, so they're willing to spend a little more money on them. Um, and lots of things can, can affect taste and preferences. You know, um, I would argue that advertising has a lot to do with it. That's why you see um, people who are famous wearing um, free clothes and such because it's basically a form of advertising. And people say, "Oh, look, those famous people wearing those kind of jeans. I want a pair of those kind of jeans," et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so. Our tastes and preferences can change all the time, um, but obviously, if you like something, you're willing to spend more on it. If you don't like something, you're not going to spend as much, and you only buy it if it gets cheaper. And those are both shifts. Okay. Um, the one that we need a little more details. Let's talk about income. Income is pretty straightforward. It's basically saying, hey, if you go into work and your boss, by some miracle, actually offers you a raise, you have more money. It doesn't say the prices of things have changed, just all of a sudden you have more money. Same thing if you were to a tax refund. All of a sudden you'd have more money than you thought and you could go out and buy things that you hadn't expected to. Of course, the opposite is true too. If by some unfortunate experience your boss comes and cuts your wages or your hours, you now take home less money. And you'd have to, and you, not that the prices have gone down, so you'd have, you'd have to shift in to the left and just buy less because you had less money. Um, expectations is pretty straightforward. It's just like supply. 
if it's reasonable to assume that in the near future demand for something will change, um, then you can choose a shift. Two examples I have here is obviously uh, here in the winter time, as it gets closer to the winter, obviously winter jackets will become increasing demand versus as we move towards spring, you can imagine swim trunks becoming more in higher demand. Um, but you know, winter for one, spring for the other. And that makes sense. Um, and it's reasonable to assume that demand for each of those will change given the change in season. Okay. Um, now for the tricky ones. The first one's compliment. Compliments are just ones that go together. And it basically says if the demand for one goes up, the demand for the other will go up as well. Best way to do is give you an example. So we take our traditional peanut butter here. Of course, most of us like it to combine it with jelly and make ourselves a perfect sandwich, which most of you will be living off of in college or after high school anyway. So these are compliments. They go together. Okay, You don't want just one. You want both together. So how does this work? Well, let me show you graphically how the demand if the demand increases of one, how that affects another one. And this requires a couple graphs. So here we go. So here's the, here's the example. Let's assume that the price of peanut butter falls. So think about what that means. If the price of the product changes, as you should recall, you're going to move along the curve, right? So here's peanut butter. Peanut butter used to cost whatever this is, 10 bucks. Now it's gone down to five dollars and so of course the law of demand states that you will move along the curve and buy more peanut butter which is great you got a lot of peanut butter but you need to ask yourself how will that affect the complement of jelly okay now that you've got a lot more peanut butter now it makes sense obviously you want more jelly now remember the price of jelly has not changed but since you're buying more peanut butter you're gonna want more jelly so look what happens okay this is a graph of jelly. You were here, and that's as much jelly as you wanted, but now you bought a lot more peanut butter, you're gonna want more jelly, okay? And so you shift to the right. You're gonna increase how much you bought, how much jelly you bought, even though the price of it didn't change. Because, of course, you have all that peanut butter and you wanna make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, not just peanut butter sandwiches, okay? Feel free to watch this again if you need to walk through it. If you have questions, just please ask in class, because this is the part that gets a little complicated. When you do complements, you don't need to draw both graphs. You must draw the shift, obviously, of the complements of the price not changed. I often find that if you do both graphs, you're less likely to make a mistake. And if you can do both graphs, then you really do get law of demand um, moving along the curve and shifts. So feel free to do both. Now, moving on to the last one. So substitutes. Substitutes, obviously, are things that can take the place of one another and basically be the same thing. So we've got the, the makeup example here, um, and we're not going to you know, split hairs over this. Makeup is makeup, we're going to assume. And of course, we're going to assume that shoes are shoes. They all just form, they all perform the same function. Okay. And a lot of differences are just from what advertisers try to convince us that they're different versus what they really are. So the question is, what happens if the price of a substitute changes? What happens to the, the substitute? And again, I'm going to show you a, a graphic example because I think that makes it clear. So it's going to be very similar. So here we go. We're going to have a substitute of two products. The products we're going to talk about are donuts and cookies. I know some of you are disappointed not use coffee, but I'm trying to mix it up. So here we go. We're going to assume that the price of cookies falls. So again, we have to ask what happens when the price of product changes, like we just said. You're going to move along the curve. So again, you're at B, okay, cookies cost $5, and they went on sale or something, and the price went down to a dollar. You will follow the law of demand and move down the curve and buy more cookies. Excellent. Now, as you buy more cookies, what's going to happen to your demand for donuts? Now, obviously, they, they each perform the same function, giving you your sugar rush and that healthy breakfast that we should all start with. So if you're eating more cookies, are you going to eat the same amount of donuts, less donuts, or more? And of course, the answer is you're going to eat less donuts. So what that means is, you're, this is being a graph for donuts, of course, as you eat more cookies, like we said over here, you're going to shift to the left on donuts and eat less. So yes, instead of consuming the 500 donuts a week, you'll drop down only and consume 400 donuts, even though the price of donuts has changed. Again, your demand for donuts has changed because of the price of cookies, which is a compliment. Again, if you were doing this on a quiz, you would just have to graph the shift, but like I just told you with, um, um, what was I thinking? Um, substitution. It's good to draw both graphs because that way you're not going to make a mistake. Um, go ahead and look over these and take some notes. If you have questions, of course, we'll talk about it in class. Again, I think the substitutes and complements um, 
are the ones that kind of trip students up the most, but they make sense if you think your way through.